Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Prime Talk. Today, I'm really excited to have a special guest. Today, I'm having Melissa Simonson. Melissa is the general manager of Empowery, which is a leading co-op for, for e-commerce uh, sellers. Uh, so a co-op is kind of innovative in the e-commerce space. So uh, we're gonna, she's going to elaborate more about it as we uh, fall into the episode. But uh, in the meantime, Melissa, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. Our pleasure, really. Um, so today's episode is really going to be all about the Melissa Simonson story. So you're going to share with us, you know, who are you, where are you from, where did you grow up, where did you go to school, how did you begin your professional career, and, you know, stations of your life until we hit to the now. So without further ado, let's jump right into it. Okay, I'm excited. Let's do it. <laughs> so you want me to just begin and just start? Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah start from the beginning. Where, where, are you, you know, where were you born, for example? Well, I was actually born in Germany. So my dad was in the army. Um, and so when, uh, when I was born, we were just about to move from, from Germany and my family had, um, there's nine kids in my family. And so- Hold on, my, hold on, Let, let's uh, <laughs> speeding, you're speeding. Hold on, so we're born in Germany where? Frankfurt, Munich, which, which, which part, which area? Do you remember? Landstuhl. Huh? Landstuhl. Landstuhl, and was this is an army base or an air force base? Um, I guess it was an army base. And what yeah. kind of, it was a major general? He was like uh, General MacArthur or something? <laughs> Not so famous as that, I think. <laughs> <laughs> he invented Europe or I mean, is this is something that uh, leg legacy from the war, the Second World War, where uh, the United States really established itself as a, uh, as a, uh, um, you know, a power uh, 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 that, oh, you know, uh, make sure the peace is, is being kept, especially in Germany. Uh, so I guess... Uh, he was in the army and that led into uh, him living there for how many years, you know? Yeah. So um, I think we lived there for maybe two or three years. I actually was born there. So I only lived there for one year and then we moved uh, to the States. We moved back to the States after that. So yeah, um, when you I moved to the States, in... uh, where did you guys move to? Washington State. Washington State <clears throat> in the Seattle area or Tacoma? That's... Yeah. So we actually used to live in Carnation, which is kind of in like the Redmond's area. Um, and that's actually where... Uh, so my older siblings, that was where they went to high school, you know, that was really where they grew up. And so that's why uh, Steve Simonson, my oldest brother, ended up there in, in the Seattle area and why I travel there so much. <laughs> yeah, so Steve Simonson is the oldest in the family, also a very well-known uh, figure in the e-commerce world. He's helping uh, a lot, a lot of sellers and is doing, is doing wonderful things. Hopefully, maybe uh, we'll have him on the show as well at some point. But, uh, and you're, what, what's, the, what's your number in the, in the, in the pack? The yeah. In the very last. Oh, very, very sweet. Very nice. So he likes to tell people that he's, he's number one <laughs> and I'm number nine. <laughs> well, if you flip it, you're number one. He's number nine also. Depends how you look at it. Okay. Upside down, right? But, uh, so you guys, uh, you know, I, I guess the next question, if you guys have nine children, are you, you're, you guys are Catholic or anything like that? or, or My Mormon? parents were uh, Mormon. Yeah, they were LDS. Oh my God. Okay. It kind of makes sense. Uh, you know, some, some of uh, faiths uh, or streams of faiths have um, the tendency to have, uh, you know, uh, blessed families and big families mm -hmm. uh, with Orthodox Jews. We have that, those elements as well uh, on the Mormons, but also I believe the Catholics. So yeah. it's very, very nice. So you grew up in the Seattle, uh, Seattle area. That's where you were basically graduated high school as well. Well, actually by the time um, I came around, so my high school years were actually in Idaho. That's why I ended up settling here. I think kind of where you go through your formative years in your youth, uh, that's where you usually end up. And that's uh, kind of why I ended up settling back in Idaho. It's small and, and uh, that's where I knew everything. It's where I learned to drive and all that stuff. So I guess, so uh, while you were, uh, or I guess what, how old were you when you moved from uh, Washington state to Idaho? Well, you remember I that was age? seven. I was in second grade. <laughs> God. Okay. So you're more of an Idaho than anything else, right? Right. As far as, far as you consider yourself and you graduate, you, uh, you graduate high school in Idaho. That's right. And what was the next step for you? Um, I actually got married when I was 18. So um, life was uh, moving fast for me at that age. Um, and I couldn't wait to get started. Like I actually was very impatient to get on with life uh, when I was in high school. And I, I found high school to be kind of a hindrance to moving on. So I ended up um, in my early in my senior year getting my GED and starting college. And then about a year later, while I was 18, I, uh, I got married. I started a family, you know, much later. We actually didn't have kids for about seven years after we got married. Um, and then, yeah, so I, I was in college and we yeah, moved so to Arizona. You moved to Arizona? <laughs> yeah. Chandler, Phoenix? Um, it was Mesa area. All right. I'm not too familiar with that area, but the Mesa, how do you spell Mesa? 
M E S A. It's about 45 minutes from Phoenix. Oh, Mesa, it's a table in Spanish. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, very cool. All right, so uh, let's touch years a little bit. So, you, what, what was the year that you moved into Arizona, and what were you doing there? What was the trigger for the move? So, I have some family in Arizona. Um, we wanted to let my uh, ex husband, who um, I had just married, he wanted to go to school for like technology stuff. And there was a great tech school in Arizona. And since I had some family there, we thought that would be a, a good place to land. So, um, so we moved down there. We had a series of unfortunate events. We had a couple of cars break down. Oh, wow. And uh, it was almost impossible for him to get to school and register. And um, so it was it kind of was not uh, the best of all situations. But you kind of have to figure it out as you go when you're that age. Yeah, you know? life is unexpected, uh, you know, challenges. Uh, hopefully that you overcome them. So what was the year that you guys moved to uh, Arizona? Let's make it as a baseline. That was 2003. 2003, you moved to Arizona. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, your, your husband back then, he's in school. And what were you doing? What was your uh, trajectory? Were you working or were you in school? Yeah, at that time, when I was 18, I actually worked uh, for Steve's company. Um, he had an online flooring store. And so I was able to work remotely. Uh, so uh, online what store? Flooring? Flooring store, yeah. So you buy the floors, right? The tiles or something? Yeah, uh, carpet and like floor tiles and all kinds of stuff, yeah. All right, so in the e-commerce game since 2003, you can say. Sure, I would say, um, yeah, I, I was at the stage where it wasn't. Um, you're in the industry. I'm not sure what you're doing yet in the industry, but but you're at least there. So what were you doing for, for the company? So I made sure that all of the products that were being sold had the proper in installation instructions, the warranties. And so I'd contact the manufacturers and make sure that those were listed appropriately. And also if we needed to change anything on the listings, uh, if we had a complaint come in that said, you know, the picture is incorrect, it looks blue, it actually came out, you know, it's a teal color, then I would make changes on the listing. And so at that time, you had to know HTML and stuff to be able to make changes to a listing. And a whole team of programmers, if you needed something more um, intricate than a quick HTML change. So nice, that's, that's a good dabbling. So you did the you know, customer service, you did you know, product experience, HTML, you know, code a little bit dabbling to, uh, to make sure that you update the, the web pages. That's, a, you know, back in 2003, that's uh, top of the line stuff back then. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And how many years did you stay in that position? Um, I think I worked there until I was about 20. So maybe um, I started there my final summer traveling to Seattle, which I did every summer when I was uh, in high school. And so you traveled to Seattle for the family to, to visit, you mean? Yeah, to work for Steve, to visit family. Um, got it. And, and the company was based out of the uh, Seattle area? That's right. Yeah. Got it. And so and, uh, 2003 until which year? Um, well, so I actually started probably in 2002 mm -hmm. um, and then carried on full time from there. Instead of just doing summers, I was actually just working full time. And so probably from 2017 till I'm sorry, from 2002 <laughs> until 2005, maybe. Yeah, so about a three-year run. You're working yeah. uh, in e-commerce with the tile company uh, for Steve, your older, uh, the oldest brother. Um, and what happened in 2005? What was the next station for you? Um, I got a job offer from a company that uh, was with some family that I knew uh, down, in, um, down in Arizona. And so I, I changed positions because... Um, one thing that I think is a tricky situation when you are sort of in the family business, uh, there can be office politics. You want to make sure that you're not, you know, giving the impression that you're overpaying your family members or anything. So we often were at the very lowest end of the, the pay mm -hmm. scale just to make sure everyone felt comfortable uh, with how much we were getting paid. Yeah, so it sounds like you guys were very cautious about nepotism. So, right. you, you know, there's some meritocracy. So whether you're family or not, you start from the bottom, you got to work your way up. But uh, uh, was it just you and Steve in the company or the whole entire family? What was the structure? So uh, two of my brothers actually also worked there at the time. I had a brother-in-law that worked there at the time. And then everyone else was just, um, you know, just regular hires. There's maybe 35 or 40 people that worked in the office. Um, uh, so, so the, I mean, the whole company about 30 to 40 people? Yeah. That was the main office. There was also a call center in the Philippines with maybe 80 people. God, wow, that's a pretty impressive setup uh, to have um, back, back, you know, in 2002. So yeah. Pretty good. Uh, all right, great. So, uh, so we realize, all right, so there's meritocracy, some family politics. Uh, let's try uh, to pivot into, I guess, a new fresh surrounding. Uh, this is 2005, and what was the position? Yeah, so um, because of that, I wanted to make sure I didn't put him in an awkward position, and I was offered a job that was a better pay uh, scale for, you know, being a new family, you know, starting a new family. So I worked for a home builder 
Um, and it was a great job. I worked with one of my brother-in-laws and um, it was really good experience. And I was good at what I did. Um, my ex husband What did you do for them though? Um, I was kind of like the, the liaison. Uh, so there would be people working out in the field and they, um, they would be completing jobs and they might have questions for um, you know, the main office of what was intended to be done or like a service provider would come in and do like the plumbing or something and they needed to have some questions answered. So I'd put them all in touch with each other and make sure that they knew what they were supposed to do. Yeah, so you're clutching everything for the construction company and this is in the Mesa area, Mesa, Arizona? Yes, yeah, it was actually Mesa Gilbert area and um, they had a bunch of different subdivisions, uh, very successful company for quite a while. Got it. Any special projects you you want to mention or you remember? Uh, you, you guys built the Pentagon or anything like that? <laughs> no, <laughs> they built very beautiful houses. I would have loved to live in one of them. They were they were like the rich and famous houses, most of them. <laughs> oh, nice. That's, that's cute. All right. Uh, okay, so 2005 until which year were you there? Uh, oh, the... that's a good question. Probably 2008, maybe. Um, because 2008, you know, there's a big crash with the housing market. My ex-husband also worked um, for a... Uh, so at that time, he worked for... It was like heavy equipment stuff. So he was repairing the equipment that's like paving the roads and the um, the subdivision. Construction, yeah. Constru and you know, in the construction and infrastructure world where it right. took a major hit in 2008. So if they don't need to be paving for houses, then they don't need the, the mechanics to fix the machinery. So he got laid off and then I got laid off. And uh, it was a, a pretty crazy situation. Um, wow, so, uh, so some, you know, it was really you guys, uh, you felt uh, the full grunt of the economical <laughs> impact of the sub subprime, uh, you know, meltdown. Uh, so, uh, so you guys were out of work for, for a few months, a few years. What was the position then? Yeah, I no, Again, I was kind of impatient to get on with, with things. Yeah. And so when we got the You're news, very <laughs> impatient with unemployment, right? <laughs> okay, yeah, which is a good thing to have. So yeah, we um, we had an old truck that I knew was probably not going to make it back to Idaho, but the kind that people like to fix up. So we sold that. We had some traveling money. We had a little bit in the bank, uh, and I had some family back in Idaho who was looking around for um, open apartments and stuff like that. And so we were able to find a place, put the deposit down, and then travel there uh, and move straight in uh, the moment we parked the car. So. So you moved back into Idaho, and this is all uh, transpired in two thousand eight. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You reacted fairly quickly from Arizona into Idaho, uh, closer to the family, and you landed on a job as well? Yeah, I, I was hired fairly quickly. Um, I got a job working for uh, a doctor's office. Um, it's actually a, a residency. So you know how you have interns who are learning to become proper physicians. This was a family medicine residency. And so I was the executive assistant for the director of the program. So it was sort of a doctor's office and also sort of part of the uh, college because it was a college town. Wow. All right. So uh, what was it like for you? And how many years did you do that? I did that for about two or three years, I think. Um, like something about the 36 months that you have over there. It's, it seems like a repetitive thing. You did the 36 months with the tile company with Steve, <laughs> another 36 with the construction, and another about uh, 24 to 36 with um, you know, the, the medical office and being executive assistant. Um, but uh, what was it like for you over there? What were you know effectively? What were you doing all day? Just uh, clutching again, uh, all the schedule, uh, you know, all the patients coming in and out. No, I really didn't do anything on the medical side of things. I I handled things with the residents to make sure that they're getting the education that they need. So I was hosting events as well. So there's a lot of things that you have to set up so that they're getting the the credits that they need in order to graduate the medical program. And so I was more on the education side of things, the event coordination side of things. And then I would also coordinate the interview season. So when they're bringing in the new interns and we're selecting, there's like this match process that you have to do. And it's a very painstaking season. <laughs> so matchmaking, right? Professional matchmaking. That's pretty, pretty interesting because uh, I guess it might, uh, these are my, you know, might've been some sprouts to what you're doing now with Empowery, which we're going to get to soon. So I, I can, I guess, sense the elements a little bit. Right. Uh, so uh, 2008 until 2010 or 11, you were there? Uh, sure. Yeah, that sounds about right. All right. So what was the next station after that? Let's see. Oh, my goodness. I'm not even sure. I haven't like thought Let's about pull out that resume. <laughs> Where, oh, OK. So um, I worked. I wanted to work from home. Like, again, I, I'm not a huge fan of like going into offices and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I had been spoiled by, you know, the time I was 17 to be able to work remotely. And I really wanted to get back to that because it was so much better for me. Um, and so I actually found a job um, that was sort of related to the position that I had had where I was doing 
transcriptions for doctors in the area that I knew and I could do it from home. And so sometimes I could go into the, uh, the hospital if I needed to, but I could also work from home. Were you doing um, it as a freelance or you were part of some sort of organization? What was the structure for you? Um, no, it was, I was actually hired by the hospital. So I worked with that. Yeah, so the hospital said this is a flexible uh, you know, work arrangement in terms of physicality. You can work from home. And I guess for you it was a, a need so because you have children, you want to raise them, you want to be there for them. Uh, make sure you I the didn't house at the time. <laughs> oh, so not your kids. So just uh, what was the, what was compelling for you to, to be at home uh, at that position I, even before I have children? I am an introvert. I, I prefer to you know I prefer to to work from home. <laughs> yeah, no, the, the comfort of your home. That's that's pretty great. Yeah. No, because on the one hand, I see that you did matchmaking, which is pretty amazing. You know, with professionals. Uh, so you have to be uh, very very good at understanding the needs of both sides and parties and make that match. Um, but essentially you were doing the same thing with all the transcripts, but they just do it remotely. So it, I guess there's a bit more peace of mind to actually complete right. the task and work because you're, you're diving into the writings and, and uh, you know, the written content of, uh, you know, individuals. All right. So how long uh, did, uh, did you stay in that position? You know, actually, what... <laughs> you're still working in it. Don't tell me you're still doing it. You're still doing it. No, no, no. This was actually less time than, uh, than my previous pattern. Because, oh, less than 36 months. All right, good. Yeah. So this one was interesting because a private company bought out our uh, community hospital and they actually um, outsourced all of the transcriptions, the radiology, a bunch of different departments. And so um, like entire departments just got laid off all at once. And that incidentally is when I found out I was pregnant as well. <laughs> wow. Timing. Another yeah. meltdown and, uh, and more challenges to come. Yeah, that's when things started to get really interesting. And this is actually where I usually start my uh, timeline with um, the other podcasts and stuff like that. Most people have heard the rest of the story now. All right, so uh, is, we're getting close to, uh, to uh, the, I guess, the known territory of, uh, and I hope it, it might uh, connect into e-commerce uh, at some point. So uh, what, 2010, 2011, that's when the, 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 you know, the, that company bought up, bought you guys out, and then uh, you had to look for another position? It was, it was actually like 2011, maybe uh, beginning of 2012. And um, I think maybe the end of 2011. And so uh, we kind of, it was very difficult for me to get hired because I was pregnant and people, you know, they, they knew I would be taking leave. And um, we really were getting very behind financially very quickly. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't find a solution in the normal places that I would look. Conventional, so, uh, you know, workplaces. Yeah. And I was, I was a little bit, again, tired of um, waiting for people to help me or to solve this problem by hiring me. And so I, um, I started a business that was a residential and commercial cleaning business because I had like $35 in my bank account at one point. Our power had been turned off because wow. we got two behind. And that's now we're um, into 2012. So again, getting behind, behind. I had my son. He's a couple months old. Our power gets turned off and I've got like $35 to my name. So I bought some cleaning supplies. I put an ad up on Craigslist and crossed my fingers and my toes that I didn't get ax murdered. <laughs> I went oh, wow. and did the cleaning job and, um, and it earned about, I think $150 or something. Um, and so after gas and the original cost of the uh, stuff, I, you know, it was like a hundred bucks at least that I put in my pocket. And then I did it again and got a bunch of referrals. I actually turned that into a proper business with some employees and I got some commercial contracts and, um, and was able to do that for about five years. That's so. amazing. That's unbelievable. I salute you. And when you hit the rock bottom, you're about to break. You took the initiative you just took the bucket, the mop and your, and, and your, your motivation and focus and you created a business out of it. Uh, it started for survival, but at, at some point it sounds like uh, if it lasted for five years and you had employees in a whole organization, it means that you were able to scale it up and you thrived. So right. I, I salute you and commend you for, for this uh, achievement. Uh, I have tremendous respect for, for individuals who are able to, um, to really create something out of nothing uh, and, and take uh, you know, full responsibility uh, you know, in, of uh, the future and destination and to, to make it a better life for them and the, uh, their family. So that's pretty amazing. Uh, and you're saying five years, so it's around 2011 to 2016? Yes, yeah, it was about 2016. And that's kind of where my personal life started to, to um, everything kind of came to a head. I was, um, I separated from my ex-husband um, you know, there's a lot going on. I, I was trying to raise two small kids essentially on my own, uh, even while I was still married. And I had, you know, a lot of stuff. I, um, there was some employees, uh, had left. I had a lot of stuff that was just on my plate. And so and how I mean, many clients, uh, did you have at your peak, I guess? 
I mean, I don't even know. I, it was enough that it would have um, kept, you know, two teams, a daytime and a nighttime team busy all the time. Wow. That's just um, being pretty aggressive. And, well, yeah. So when I, I was like, okay, we're, we're getting to a weird place right now. My personal life kind of started to interfere with my ability to do business. And I, again, I, I can't really explain it. It's just kind of when you are in a weird headspace, then you're making the wrong decisions sometimes. And even you are not quite sure why. Mm -hmm. um, and so it started to affect my profitability and my ability to carry on really um, and manage my people. And so in the end, I was really trying to work, you know, daytime when you clean residences while people are at work and nighttime when um, you're doing the commercial contracts after people leave the office. And so I'm working day and night. There's several times that I went without sleep for a couple of days at a time trying to keep up with everything. Oh, that's, that's and, crazy. Yeah, it was. It was too much. You didn't sure. have any help at the house, at least a uh, hard help? No, no. Wow. I mean, you should have, but okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, I sort of have a, maybe my weak spot is that I think I can do it all and I don't need anyone to help me. <laughs> Superwoman. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, I got it. <laughs> And then, so, uh, wow. I mean, so, uh, so it came to, well, how did it culminate this whole situation? Uh, well, there's a couple um, pivotal moments. I remember one where um, I was kind of doing a marketing push um, because I wanted to get like a team back in action so that I could kind of hand off some of the work, but I wanted to make sure it wouldn't affect our ability to handle the expenses and stuff. So I was doing the jobs myself so that I could hand them off. Um, and for the marketing push, I wanted to make sure I had like, you know, before and after pictures. So this one house that I was cleaning, this is so embarrassing. Um, mm. <laughs> I jumped onto like the kitchen countertop so that I could clean the top of like the upper cabinets. Mm -hmm. And um, there had been a ceiling fan that I had turned off in order to make that, um, to do that part of the clean. And, and it turns, it turns off, that it wasn't off? Well, it, <laughs> I forgot to get the after pictures when I finished it. And uh -huh. so then I had gotten down, I'm like, oh, I'm sweating. So I turned the ceiling fan back on and then I'm like, oh, the after picture. And then I hop back up there and just like cut my head open. I'm like bleeding. Oh no. <laughs> down my oh neck. God. Yeah, it was not great. So you and, got what's it really hurt or? Um, no, I mean, it was fine. I got stitches that night. Um, and then I went back and finished the job. And wow. the problem with that was, you know, it was a turning point for me because I realized work-wise and home-wise that something really had to change that I couldn't carry on the way I had been and you know more pivotally when I got back to my house to change my shirt because there's blood all over it and um you know to talk to my uh spouse at the time about it uh he was happy to just let me go back to work after just having gotten stitches and not offer to help or anything and I realized you know this probably isn't that normal maybe I should be uh doing something different here so that's when I got separated. Um, and that's when um, I decided, you know, I need to cut back on the jobs until I have a better plan. And, and my mind is in a better spot to refocus my attention. Got it. And all this was around 2016, about four years ago. Yeah. Yep. Got it. All right. So take us to the next station. You, uh, you you're reshuffling again, you know, uh, laying tracks for, for uh, other destinations. So what was it? What were the tracks? Yeah, so I mean, at first, I really was not sure where to go from there. Um, I, I finalized the divorce, I was still wanting to do stuff from home. And so I did a few things uh, that had a few different streams of income so that I was able to provide for my kids and stuff, um, you know, and throughout the divorce process and everything, all of that was very exhausting and emotional and stuff like that. We had been married almost 13 years at that point, I think. Mm -hmm. So, um, and this so is once again, this is all in Idaho and the, 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 the city you guys are living in is? Yeah, Idaho Falls. Idaho Falls, got it, okay. So, um, yeah, so it kind of was tricky. And I, I honestly, I did not have a path chosen at that time, but um, I kind of had identified a few important features that had come to light for me. So one was I didn't want to let other people choose for me what my path would be. I didn't want to wait for someone else to hire me, to help me, right? And so I knew that I needed to come up with something and that it would have the flexibility that I needed. I also knew that I didn't want to have any other forces in my life um, relationship wise that were prohibiting me from having whatever life I wanted. And so whatever job that I took next, whatever relationship I got in next, I wanted to make sure that it fit sort of the new outlook that I had created for myself, the new mandates and uh, 
you know, mantra, I guess I was living by. Um, and so Steve actually simultaneously, so this is now the end of 2017. So I kind of just did things here and there um, and kind of got back into a better emotional spot. And, um, and then Steve had contacted me about Empowery. And now I had had enough kind of small wins between, um, you know, my business stuff. And then, um, and then when Steve contacted me that I was a little bit more confident now in like, okay, now we can carry on and, and I'm not as um, doubtful of my own abilities anymore, given the stuff that was going on before. So you need like and, about a year to build out your confidence, rearrange your life, you know, um, you know, s set up the right mindset. And, and by the time that happened, Steve uh, reached out. So you were able to better settle into, to starting uh, your position with Empowery. Uh, yeah. So, so that being said, give us a little bit of explanation about what, you know, about Empowery, what it is, what's the mission, what's the purpose, uh, you know, let's dive into that for a moment. Yeah. Oh my goodness. So when he contacted me and he told me sort of what the out, um, the intention of Empowery was, I was so excited. Um, I love helping people. I love helping women succeed, especially and women entrepreneurs, because working at the doctor's office, that was kind of a bizarre situation watching like men be doctors and only hire women nurses and stuff in this area. Mm -hmm. um, so he asked me to join um, and run this co-op. And he said he wanted to start it as a nonprofit because he wanted to make sure that it was some somewhere that people could trust. You know, in the e-commerce space, it's very easy to get suspicious of service providers, of, um, you know, any new faces that you see in e-commerce, they're, they're a little suspect. <laughs> and so having a nonprofit that has an exhaustive vetting process to make sure that you're actually reaching out to the right kinds of people that will take care of you and not scam you, not run off with your money or beta test you with your advertising dollars. <laughs> Yeah. Um, that's something that is really useful right now for um for amazon sellers so, so, I so let me let me give some context here so uh, steve your brother which year 2017 was it yep this is the end of 2017 right he co-founded uh he founded completely or co-founded it he co-founded empowery with evan hackle who is an expert on cooperatives Got it. Amazing. So it's an, an, an innovative idea for, for the e-commerce world. Essentially, it's, uh, Empower is an organization that's dedicated to educate sellers, support sellers and marketplace sellers, uh, e-commerce sellers, of, you know, all kinds and shapes uh, mm -hmm. and empower them by um, making sure that whatever uh, content that, you know, they, they our educational content that they uh, source or provide is, is, is bona fide, is legit. All service providers that are on the platform, they're, uh, they're vetted, they got references, they're they're trustworthy uh and, and not only that uh, uh you know your ability to access um the top of the line providers that will empower you uh there's there's collective discounts if you because you're part of the co-op so you're getting at a better rate or a bit of better discount uh plus there's components of uh, of um um uh, revenue or income for the co-op members correct yeah that's exactly right so the really exciting thing is the part that the nonprofit plays here is that most of the time when somebody refers you to a service, they're probably getting a kickback for that. Um, you know, they're getting an affiliate commission or something. Right. And so you always have to, again, view it a little suspiciously and say, is this good for you or is it good for me? Um, in our case, we didn't want that to be a question. And so we did start it as a nonprofit, meaning that the kickback, 51% of it goes to our members rather than, um, rather than us just getting all the benefit we retain 49% or less, depending on, you know, if overhead is covered so that we can uh, manage the co-op and continue to serve the entrepreneurs. So let's touch the flow, right? I'm an Amazon seller, for example. I pay an X amount to be part of Empowery. Then I start using all these services and I pay them for their services, for their solutions. And I'm, you know, I'm growing my business, but the money that I paid them, some of that money will be basically given back as an affiliate commission to the co-op, to Empowery. And in turn, me as a member, I'm going to get some of that money to, uh, back, right? That's right. So based on your level of involvement with the partners, you get an annual check and that's your, um, as a shareholder, you get dividends from the co-op. And that's part of that is based on your participation with all of our many um, partners. Amazing. That I found it to be extremely innovative uh, in this terrain, in this environment. Uh, so uh, I think it's almost a, like a no brainer. If you're an Amazon seller or any kind of microplace seller that is in need for education, for, for materials that can help you grow and, and, and solidify your business and tools and services that uh, can help you as well. Go yeah. to Empower. That's a source to, you know, you can use it as a source to, to shop around, by the way, because there's, there's so much, such a variety. And if you choose to opt in anyway to these uh, services, you can do it through Empowery, where you're going to get a better rate plus uh, money back with dividends because you're a, a member of the co-op. So, um, you know, I'm originally from Israel. We have a, a, um, these special um, 
villages, small you know, enclaves uh, where people live. It's called kibbutz. Ever heard of a kibbutz? I have heard that word. Uh, so essentially, essentially it's a commune. It's, uh, they, they, they all work together. There's usually a factory or some, whatever it is, and it's a co-op. And then uh, from their factories or whatever businesses that they have and, and the kibbutz, all the members get you know, a dividends. Uh, so you created the, the kibbutz model into the e-commerce space, which is uh, yeah. pretty cool and innovative. By the way, a lot of these kibbutzes uh, today in Israel, they became so successful. You know, the, the companies that they have inside the kibbutz, they're public companies running billions of dollars worth of, uh, of, of revenue, uh, you know, corporations. So it did uh, give birth to a tremendous uh, businesses uh, and, uh, that, uh, that uh, were generated from being a part of the co-op, which eventually uh, uh, empowered it with more and more dividends. So... Um, I do recommend, you know, full disclosure, uh, Getita, we're, we're part of the Empower you movement and we offer our, our products with, uh, you know, great incentives to the members. And once again, the income that we generate from, from the members, we uh, we pay some of that back to Empower you, and which in turn is go back to the sellers. So this is kind of the em empowering cycle and circle that, that's, uh, that's going on. Uh, so 2017, let's go back to you and to the story, right? So 2017... Well, one last thing. So, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Um, one thing that you said is that's very important is that because they're part of the kibbutz um, and you know the co-op, um, you know, kind of community that made those guys more successful. And I think what people really miss um, in the explanation of a cooperative in the e-commerce space because it's not really known is that it it takes you from being a small seller to being part of something much bigger. And so instead of kind of having to take whatever comes and just being like, I, you know, nobody will listen to me. I'm just a little guy. I can't take on Amazon. I can't take on walmart.com or eBay. You know, it makes you have a louder voice because there's so many sellers now who are saying the same thing. And so if you have someone representing you as the little guy, then now you can achieve more. Now you can have the edge that maybe some other people don't have. Amazing. Yeah. I totally relate to that. So uh, imagine if you have to shop all around for all these uh, solutions, uh, but now you're buying as, as a part of a major group. So th there's more purchasing power, so to speak. Plus, you know that it's working for so many others, it's going to work for you. So, so many points to uh, or pains that it can alleviate for you just trying to swim in, in the, the great ocean where you're just part of a larger ship that can steer its way uh, into safe, safer grounds for you and hopefully to islands where you're going to find tremendous gold and success. Uh, so I like that. Um, okay, so 2017, you uh, hear about the idea, you get excited about it, and you jump right into it. That was kind of the, the dynamic. Oh, yeah. Like, as soon as you told me about it, I was like, this is absolutely made for me. It was like serendipitous. All the things that I had just decided, you know, before I'm going to get into something serious or long term, it's got to be good for my soul. Like I had just, I'd been through too much to, um, to allow for anything else in my life. And so having something where my job was to help people and to help entrepreneurs, which is certainly something that I'm very passionate about, something that could, um, you know, I didn't know at the time, but eventually led to um, helping empower women entrepreneurs. Um, and then let's talk about that. So uh, what are the elements that you, um, you found for the past three years, you know, being an empower where, you know, you really felt the impact for, for women and, and their success? Yeah, so I kind of entered um, the event space. Um, so that was 2017. And then 2018, I just did a few like uh, Catalyst 88 events and stuff like that. But 2019, I really started to enter the main uh, e-commerce event scene. And I noticed a huge disparity in the number of men speakers versus the number of women speakers. And, um, you know, at first I'm observing this and uh, it's just the norm. There's, uh, it depends on which conference as well, how many women attendees there are. Um, but it was very much predominated by men, <laughs> male dominated. you <laughs> <Guilty as> charged, <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's not like there's anything sinister about that or, or malicious, but I think that, um, that I started to realize that it didn't have to be that way. That if, if somebody sort of helped pave the way to show like there's there's a different way to do this and that maybe if they see it happen and see it successfully done then others would follow and so um so we decided uh in about may maybe may of 2019 that we would try and host a women's conference we started putting the word out there and there was mixed response at first i think some people um felt like you know why a women's conference why can't men be there and stuff and the idea actually was not to exclude men. Men were welcome to attend. We just wanted to have enough women on the stage to show that an event could be wholly presented by women and still be very successful. So at least 
half the women at other events uh, would be reasonable, right? Yeah, yeah. so it's, it's almost like an incubator. You say this, let's, let's do this. Let's put them in that position, see how the event goes. Let's see the caliber of, you know, the, the quality of the content of the whole experience. And if it's top notch, it's an indicator for, at least for this industry, this innovative industry called e-commerce, this is definitely space for women to participate on the highest levels. And especially when they want to educate and lead on other sellers. Uh, so that was kind of, I guess, the experiment that you guys have tried to take the initiative and set up for women. And I would assume it went well. It was amazing. I, I don't think that I have ever been to an event like that. And certainly that was, um, that was the first event that I had hosted solely. So we had done a Seattle summit where Steve was sort of the MC and the host. And so he'd go on in between each speaker and stuff. So I helped organize that event, but I really wasn't, um, you know, on the stage or anything. This what, what was the name of the event? The Seattle Summit, the Empower Seattle Summit, Empower Seattle Summit, uh, presented wholly by women. Of course, the audience could be at every any shape or color. That sorry, that was referring to uh, the one that Steve had MC. The Empower Seattle Summit was just our regular sort of mastermind live events. Um, Got it, men, women, all, all everything works. Yeah. Okay, so that was kind of your first event to participate, you know, within the Empower uh, community. Uh, that gave you, I guess, the confidence to set up the, the next event with the women's event. Right. So the next one was me totally by myself hosting and organizing and everything. Mm -hmm. So that was called the Empower Women's Conference. We hosted that this year in February of 2020, right before oh, everything right started. before the pandemic. And it was incredible. Um, and the feedback that I got was, it was so special to me because people said, you know, it, it was intentionally a smaller event. We didn't want to have more than 100 or 150 people because we wanted people to really engage with each other and have more of a... Um, Intimate experience, right? Exactly. Very intimate. But, but um, this took place where? In Seattle as well? This was actually um, hosted on Manhattan Beach in California. Oh, wow. Okay, good. West Coast. Oh. Huh? Yeah, we're going to yeah. have to drag you guys over to the East Coast uh, sometime. Absolutely. I'd be happy. <laughs> <laughs> when you said Manhattan Beach, I thought Brooklyn because they also have Manhattan Beach, uh, Beach in uh, Brooklyn. But when you said uh, California, <laughs> you know, you twisted my, uh, my mind for a minute. <laughs> Okay, good. All I, right, actually, so. I actually was in um, in Brooklyn for the event this January, though. <laughs> yeah, 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 very nice. Um, yeah, right before the pandemic, we had good events in January, February, and March. Everything melted away. Uh, great. So February, Man Manhattan Beach in California, 100, 150, uh, you know, guests. The guests are, can be uh, were women or any kind of or shape or it form was, of people. It was mostly women who attended this one because I think, again, people – Probably we misnamed it by calling it a women's conference. I think most people assume that the attendees are women. Uh, yeah, yeah, the design was that the speakers or the educators are women, right. but the audience can be any shape or form, but maybe we got a little bit of a story. So it's more, uh, toward, uh, or the content at least was uh, more uh, oriented towards, uh, you know, yeah. uh, women, uh, which is still, still okay. Uh, great success. You, you know, prove the point. And then what happened? The pandemic hit? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, so I mean, that was very successful. We did have, you know, like Norm Farrar, Kevin King, you know, big uh, influencers uh, in the space who wanted to show their support for women. They were definitely there. Um, but yeah, I mean, we get back home. And actually, as I was landing in Idaho Falls, I saw an alert, uh, a news alert that said that the first cases had been seen in LA, like mm -hmm. that weekend. And I was like, oh, oh no. I was just around that corner. So yeah, I'm <laughs> almost being touched by Corona. Yeah. That was pretty crazy. And then, I mean, it, this year got pretty crazy pretty fast after that. I, my kids, I pulled them out of school and then the school shut down. Um, I admit to going a little bit crazy <laughs> with like having my kids home all the time, quarantined. You know, they were not going back and forth from uh, my house to their dad's house. Um, I was homeschooling them, which none of us enjoyed. <laughs> oh, yeah. So you actually took the initiative to educate them? Yeah, I mean, I did. I, I wanted to make sure that they weren't going to get behind or anything um, and trying to do that while keeping up with your full time, more than full time job. Um, and, you know, all the other responsibilities is, is pretty crazy. Right, so during the pandemic, everything went virtual and you were able to uh, keep Empowery alive and pumping and growing. Yeah, yeah, we, we kept things going with Empowery. We uh, we did um, some digital content through like June or so. Um, and then we really were trying to make some changes going forward, like to increase our membership and to really in increase the value that we're offering to our members. And so instead of doing a lot of stuff um, online and, and stuff like that, we actually started to do some admin internal work and website building. We created a new member portal so that people can go in and see all the content they have access to um, and just make it really easy uh, to get everything that they pay for. 
Got it. Amazing. All right. So this is where we're at today. Uh, you know, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have empowering, empowering, um, you know, uh, e-commerce e sellers, uh, you know, paving the way for women to take more leadership position in, in the industry. Uh, so let's uh, do a quick recap of what we have so far, right? Around 2003, uh, you started, uh, two, sorry, 2002, you started working, you know, already in the e-commerce space with your older brother, Steve. Uh, you know, you guys are selling, uh, you know, a, a floor of you know, products and then you do it for about three years from 2003 till uh, about 2006. In 2006, you shift to um, Arizona, to Miss mm -hmm. Arizona, and you work for um, uh, the company that did what? Uh, uh, this was home, build. uh, home builders, right? Construction, you know, uh, high-end construction for, for uh, the wealthy. Uh, mm -hmm. You do it for about around, uh, three years as well. So around 2000 and... Um, it was about 2008. It was right when the crash happened. Right. So in 2008, yeah. the meltdown came in and you moved uh, to Idaho mm -hmm. and you take a position with, uh, uh, you know, the medical field where you uh, you make a connection between, you know, residents and, you know, organizations and you're doing all this matchmaking. You did it for a little while. And then you, you said, you know what, I want to pivot into working from my own home. So you do, uh, you know, uh, 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 prescriptions, you said, what, are you, what is that called? Uh, transcriptions. Transcriptions, right, for, for you know, um, medical staff. So you, it's, it's all good. And then it got bought out, it got outsourced, and you pivot into... Uh, uh, essentially entrepreneurship. You take a, a bucket and a mop and you start your own, uh, you know, uh, uh, cleaning business, uh, you know, for about five years uh, and you took, you know, uh, full control of your life. But then you realize, you know, uh, it, it grew from that success. It, it, it brought other strains, right? You're working right. at night. It brought other strains. You said, I'm going to have to reshuffle and pivot. So around 2006, you know, life shakes apart a bit and, you know, you do separate uh, for, from your spouse. And then for about a year, you kind of, uh, try, you know, you solidify your position. And in 2017, you head into the world of e-commerce. Once again, you know, something that started around 2002 with your brother uh, takes a full circle, um, about 15 years later in 2017, where you would jump into the opportunity to, uh, to, uh, to um, join Empowery. So today you're the general manager. And of course, what you're doing with Empowery, you're taking all these components they did throughout the years where helping people, connecting people, uh, just hop, you know, offering support on the highest level that you can with passion with, uh, and, and also uh, realizing that you were yourself a woman, you were, you were facing so many challenges. What can you do to give back you know, uh, to women as well? And package it all up. This is uh, Melissa's story uh, you know, as we find her at this point. So thank you so much. It's been very honest and, uh, of you to you know, share all the story. And, and I, uh, I, I do wish you a much more tremendous success as you go along. So now to close the episode, we're going to focus on two things. The first thing will be if somebody wants to learn more and reach out to you, where can they find you? And the, the last thing will be is uh, what is your message of hope and inspiration for entrepreneurs listening out there? So um, if you want to contact me, you can uh, email me directly at melissa at empowery.com. Uh, you can also go to empowery.com slash contact if you want to learn more about Empowery. And the first member of our team who sees that will um, we'll kick that over to the rest of us. And then uh, you can find us on social media at Empowery Co-op. And uh, I am at Sulin Smiles on Instagram. Let's come again. Uh, Instagram is what? At? At Sulin Smiles. It's a nickname my brother gave me. I didn't think I'd be using it professionally. Sulin, how do you pronounce? How do you spell Sulin? S-U-L-I-N. Yeah, Sulin Smile. <laughs> Smiles. Smiles, plural. Sul and Smiles uh, and on Instagram. Very cool. Yeah. All right. And what's your message of hope and inspiration for uh, entrepreneurs listening out there? I think the main thing is that, you know, when people struggle, when you have failures, when you, um, you know, you're trying to reflect and, and remember who you used to be or who you intended to be, um, you know, if you, if you take too much time looking at yourself through other people's eyes or how you think they might view you or how you fear they might view you. You're wasting all of your time and your, your potential ability to get yourself out of a hard situation. Instead, if you focus on the things that you need to get done, you know, the things that, you know, what's, what's the next thing? Uh, it doesn't seem like it's such a challenging um, move to make. You know, sometimes that's all you can handle. That's all you can do is just what's, what's the, the next move that I need to make here. And when you do that and you look back on it later, you realize how powerful of a shift that was for you and, and what a powerful move that made for the, the rest of your life and how it might've changed the director and the direction forever. Um, but it's just that one move and don't waste time. Don't waste time looking at um, what you think other people are saying about you or thinking about you because it just, it's none of your business. <laughs> yeah, I feel that. So this is empowering, uh, you know, um, 
words from uh, the, the general manager of Empowery. You know, don't focus on why this happened to you. Focus on the next on the next move that will get you out of that situation. And as you keep focusing again and again on the next move, you'll be able to look back and say, "Whoa, it made such an impact. I'm in a much better position." And just keep doing it uh, as you go along to find more and more success. So, Melissa, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Uh, thank you everybody for listening and watching. Until next time. Thank you.